Hi everyone. So today we're talking about crazy rich Asians. Um, first, why did I choose this book for this class? Um, this was actually something that another professor suggested to me and I almost didn't take the suggestion because I read the book before and I thought that it was kind of a little silly. But then when I took a, so a second look at it and I read it again, I actually realized that there are a number of things the author's doing that I think are really interesting. Um, I think that there are um, a lot of interesting themes in this book that we can kind of talk about. And also, I really wanted to choose it because it is so much different from the other things that we're reading and talking about and, and looking at. Um, so let's get into it. An overview. If you have not read the book or seen the movie based on the book, which is quite a bit different, um, the book is broken up into three sections. So we're going to be looking at one section each week for this unit. Um, but it follows a couple different characters, um, but primarily Rachel and her boyfriend, Nick. Um, Rachel is a college professor in New York City, and so is Nick, and that's how they met. And so we have this wedding um, in Singapore between Colin and uh, Aram Araminta. I almost said it wrong. Um, so Nick's friend Colin and his fiance Araminta are getting married. And for um, the people of Singapore, this is the wedding of the year. This is going to be a huge event. So the first part of the book follows Rachel um, going to uh, really in New York at first with Nick. And then um, it leads up to the revelation that Nick's family is one of the wealthiest in the world and one of the wealthiest in Singapore, and that he really comes from this whole other um, culture that she never realized because of their class differences. And so we follow a couple other characters in there as well. Um, Eleanor, Nick's mother, um, Astrid, his cousin, and sometimes um, another cousin of his as well. Um, and each chapter um, portion, because these three books, but still broken up into chapters. So each chapter is named after the character that it kind of follows. And we'll get into that in a minute when we talk about style and narrative point of view. But after the revelation, book two kind of picks up where um, Rachel realizes <laughs> what she has gotten herself into with this trip to Singapore. And we lead up to the wedding in part two. And then part three is kind of um, the wedding and some of what I would call the aftermath. So some of the fallout from some of the events that happen in the rest of the book. And then we have our resolution as well. And I don't want to tease any of it too much. Um, but that's the general overview of what you're going to be reading. So to start off with, I want to talk about the setting. There really are two different um, settings in this book. Let's just highlight where we've been so far. There we go. Um, the first is New York City, and then the second is Singapore. Now, it's interesting to me because New York City is often depicted as this um, great place of wealth and society and that kind of thing. And in this book, it's not. So I think that that's kind of an important piece that um, the author wants you to see that really Americans in this world are looked at as like unsophisticated and uncultured and like they have some money, but not as much money as the people who, who live in Singapore. Um, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a history of Singapore. So I'm going to close this for a second. Um, just to kind of show you where it is on the larger map here of Europe, Africa, and Asia. Singapore is down here. I'll zoom in on it for you. <laughs> and um, and then this is a map just of Singapore now. So it is, um, if, it, it could be confusing if you don't know the way that they talk about it in the book. Singapore is an island nation. So um, sometimes they talk about the island and that would be the main island of Singapore. You can see here that there are some smaller islands that are part of the country as well that are kind of in the surrounding areas. Um, Singapore is also a city 
And of course, it's the country too. So it's kind of like how we talk about New York, New York City and New York State kind of get confused sometimes. Um, but that is Singapore. And essentially, one of the reasons that there are so many wealthy people there is that we'll go big, back to the bigger map. Um, if you look where Singapore is, it's really in this spot that was essential for trade. So the British, who colonized just about everything, um, the British in the early 1800s came in and they wanted to, um, they basically created a treaty with the people of Singapore in 1819 to allow them to um, have a major port at the city. So because of um, all of the importing and exporting going on, you have a an island nation that starts to become wealthy because of this trade, um, and especially with their relations with the British. So Singapore comes into direct control under the British authorities in 1867. Um, a lot of the local chiefs are pressured to giving up their territories to the British East India Company, that's the, the trading company, and um, it, it essentially at that point starts to become a hub for immigrants who are looking to seek wealth and fortune um, with some of this trade. So it happens that for about a hundred year period, 1840 to 1940, really um, what they talk about in this book is a lot of the time like before the war. So just before World War II, then you have a, a huge influx, but it starts happening around 1840 um, that many people from mainland China, because of the um, commerce and opportunities that Singapore applied, affords, um, they move down and they, they migrate. So they're coming, let me zoom out, they're coming from China down to Singapore, um, really to kind of seek fortune and that kind of thing. Um, and especially this influx really occurs when um, communist China, um, sorry, rather when, when, when the communists take over China. So in 1911, um, this is where we have the Chinese Revolution, the fall of the Chinese mainland um, completely to communism, though, happens in 1949. So basically in the 1930s and 40s and, and a little bit before in the teens and 20s, people see the upheavals going on in China. And especially if they do have money already, um, they're more prone to leave. So what's been happening recently is a very similar thing that um, the communist government in China has begun cracking down more and more on people who have become wealthy under their communist system. So they're looking to redistribute wealth and things like that. So you have even more people coming down um, into Singapore from China who already have money and are, are looking to kind of expand. A lot of the people in Singapore now um, are from, uh, were originally from China, which is kind of what our book is concerned with. But you also have people coming from Malaysia, um, from India, from the Middle East, um, kind of drawn to that area. So because of that, Singapore, I'll, I'll go to a picture of it here. There we go. There's the city. Um, because of that, Singapore has one of the highest concentrations of billionaires in the world, um, you know, per, per square mile and per capita, there are an, a large, large number of billionaires. And that's where, what this story is concerned with. Um, if you want to see, this is kind of a picture of what a lot of Singapore used to look like. They still had some villages and things like that. Most of the villages now are towns because the island population has become so dense, you just need bigger buildings and, and more room for the people living there. Um, and then this is one of their beaches, gorgeous, um, but a lot of their beachfront area, even in those smaller islands, has also become developed. So in the book, you have some tension between 
um, the nouveau riche, the new rich people, um, the people who are just coming from China, and these established Singapore families, many of whom are Chinese from descent. Um, and so what happens when Rachel enters this world as a relatively poor professor, we do okay, but we're not billionaires, right? Um, as a relatively poor college professor, um, who interestingly enough teaches economics, she's kind of thrown into this world where um, there's a lot of speculation into who she is and where she's from and who her people are and who her family is. Um, and a lot of them worry that maybe she's new money or maybe she's very poor and she's trying to be with Nick because of his money, when in reality she didn't know. So the history of um, all that economic stuff is is really in the background and drives the characters. And they will mention little things here and there about when their family came to Singapore or how long they've been there or how they made their wealth. Sorry, I had to, my dog was barking. I don't know if you guys heard that. But at any rate, you're also going to hear characters talking about the ways that they're um, gaining money. Um, Astrid talks a lot about real estate and the different properties she owns. So that's one of the sectors that people get into. Um, another sector is banking. We have a scene where Rachel is at a bachelorette party and the girls are talking to um, one of the friends about how she shouldn't date um, a particular gentleman because he has a job in banking, but not the right type of job in banking um, to keep her in the lifestyle to which she has become accustomed. Um, so shipping, real estate, banking, um, these are all of the things that we're going to see. And in many cases, it's the men who are doing these um, Sorry, pull that back up. There we go. It's the men who are doing the work, but we'll talk about kind of the family structures in a little bit. So Kevin Kwan is our author, and essentially you're going to um, have another video from him talking about the book, but basically this is a, a book that he began writing because his father was ill and he was spending time with his father and his father started telling all these stories about his childhood. Um, and Kevin Kwan kind of realized, you know, that, as I said, this is a book that's quite a bit different from the other Asian American literature that we're going to be reading. And he felt like there was nothing in the marketplace or in, in current contemporary literature that showed the type of world that he had come from. Um, so his family um, helped to found one of the Methodist churches in Singapore. Um, religion is a theme in the book that we will uh, get to in a second. But um, because of that, he, he kind of came from this world and he didn't see that world and and these wealthy people especially represented in the literary landscape and i think that that's really important to note so what is interesting is that some people have said that this book is satire so satire essentially is exaggeration to hold something up to ridicule so you're exaggerating something so that you're kind of poking fun at it and showing um, the, the ways that society has gone wrong, right? The difficulty with this book is that while I do think he is criticizing, um, I'll put that in too. If I can spell. Um, so holding things up to, to ridicule, to ridicule and criticism. I think that he is criticizing in some ways this society. There are um, some very distinct uh, things that they do that he he's trying to say, you know, in terms of like the gossip and some of the racism and things like that, that he's trying to um, show the, the, the negative side of this society. However, he has been very clear that this uh, all of the things that happen in this book, or almost all of the things, are based on people that he has known and events that really took place. And in fact, he actually says that in many cases, there's the dog, 
In many cases, he downplayed some of the extravagance and wealth because it would be not as believable. So I want you to kind of look at that and look to see the ways that he's um, kind of poking fun at this society or criticizing some of the things that they do, but also look for um, the ways that he might not be exaggerating. Um, so is it satire or is it not? I don't know if I can fully place it in that category, um, but it certainly is kind of, um, it is meant to be funny in many instances. And that brings us to rom-com tropes. So Tropes are things that you see all of the time um, in different types of literature, film, um, television, that kind of thing. And um, in a romantic comedy, there are these, like, I'll call them beats. There are things that happen in a romantic comedy that you expect to happen. And in some instances, they kind of become cliches. So the setup for this book... In some ways, it is a romantic comedy. In some ways, it isn't. Just just as I just said with the satire. Um, we have Rachel and Nick as an established couple. So they're not having like a meet cute. They're not having a meet cute kind of thing where like it's crazy and they meet each other and then they fall in love instantly. Um, but one of the things we do have is this classic misunderstanding. And... It's one of the things that drives me crazy about romantic comedies and also with this book that um, the reader knows that Nick's family is wealthy. It takes Rachel a while to figure it out. Um, she talks to her friend who lives in Singapore. She talks to her mother. She, um, she never really actually talks to Nick. And... I think that sometimes in romantic comedies, you have like a classic misunderstanding where just a five minute conversation could clear everything up, you know. Um, but because of this, this misunderstanding, it does produce a lot of comedy of um, Rachel trying to kind of fit in and not really fitting in of her becoming eventually angry with Nick and kind of calling him out for not really preparing her for this world that she's been kind of thrust into. And I think that, um, not to touch too much on number 10, but I think that um, the, the, the woman who wants to get married but doesn't want to tell her boyfriend that she wants to get married, we have that kind of um, trope or cliche with Rachel. Um, and with Nick, we have for a while the kind of clueless boyfriend who doesn't really understand the privilege that he's been um, brought up in. And the rules for men and the rules for women in this society are quite different. And Nick, especially being part of this society, I think is removed from uh, from a lot of those social rules that Rachel finds herself in. For example, wearing a, a dress that um, is not a designer label um, and getting kind of made fun of for that and gossiped about. And then later um, also wearing a dress that is a designer label and then they gossip about her for that. And so it's those kind of things in a wealthy society that somebody not from the society, there's like a lot of unwritten rules that she has to navigate. And so in some ways it brings out comedy. Um, and in other ways you can really see some of the points um, that he's trying to hold these people up to, as I said, to ridicule or to criticism because of the way that they're behaving and acting toward her. So the style and the narrative point of view. Um, it's interesting to me because the way that the author has chosen to write this is not from first person point of view. So instead, we have a third person narrator. Um, first person is from the person's direct point of view. So I did this, I did that, I feel, I think, right? Um, third person is someone just narrating the events of the story. So on a continual, on a kind of, if you think of it as a continuum, on the one hand, we often have an omniscient narrator who knows everything 
everything that anyone is thinking, um, everything that everyone is doing. Um, on the other hand, on the other end of that scale, you have a limited narrator. So that means that um, third person narrator follows just one character and they only know what that character is thinking, feeling, doing. Um, and whatever the character sees is kind of reported on. This is interesting in terms of the narration because it's, it's toward the omniscient side but at the same point in each chapter we are kind of following a character so it's interesting that even though we're following astrid or eleanor or rachel um and then sometimes rachel and nick or um astrid and her husband um and the extra name gets put in there um we have a um a real, it's not completely limited just to that person's point of view. It's just kind of like Rachel's at the bachelorette party. And so that's where this chapter is going to be. But there are people gossiping and she might not completely hear what they're saying. Um, there are people thinking things about her that she does not know. Um, and so in that way, the narrator is more omniscient where it's kind of telling us everything that's going on, whether or not Rachel sees it. But it is limited to where she is during that chapter. So that's just something to kind of take note of. Um, another point of style and narration that I think is interesting, um, I just talked about the rom-com tropes and I mentioned Rachel and then sometimes Rachel and Nick. For a book that's supposed to be kind of a romance between the two of them, they are really not together most of this book. Um, so we see them together in New York, and then we see them together um, later on at different points. So he takes her to dinner with his family, um, and again, he, you know, they go to the wedding, and even then they're, he's in the wedding, she's not. So even then they're not really together. Um, and then they have uh, 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 an encounter, <laughs> um, I would call it, later on when she gets mad at him for these events. So it's interesting that the, the author made that style choice. Again, I think he's trying to show the separation of the men and the women in this society that we don't have um, when the two characters are in the United States. Um, so that's something to note. Another style point to note is that um, the vocabulary kind of changes a little bit depending on which character the narrator is following. So when we have Rachel, she's a college professor and she's not from this society and she has never been to Singapore before. So she's, the, the narrator uses a lot of descriptive words, um, uh, a little bit of a higher level vocabulary when it's focusing on Rachel. When we focus on Astrid, we don't have the descriptions of the landscape or her you know, wondering or thinking about where she is or pontificating that because she's lived in Singapore her entire life, right? So with her, we do get a lot more um, descriptions of fashions. <laughs> she's very interested in clothing um, and that kind of thing. So look for some of those subtle changes. Um, first, how the characters are separated and how the narrator um, sometimes is omniscient and a little bit limited as they're following. And then also just a little bit of subtle style differences in each chapter um, between Eleanor, Astrid, um, Rachel, and then uh, some of the other characters as well.